Okay, welcome back to the Jota's Hour. We're on episode 11 right now. This was supposed to be episode 10 at first. Had to do a little bit of a retrial, but we have brought back in Dante Bruschi and Case Mankins, of course. Going to be a massive interview today. These are two budding stars who are just going to do great things in the football field in the future. And first, to start off, just to break the ice in this interview, I'd want to ask you guys, how has it felt growing up around sports your entire life, basically, at being a massive part around you? Obviously, both of you didn't really start or Dante didn't start playing football until freshman year. Case, you played a little bit before freshman year, right? Yeah. But freshman year was not start getting serious for Case, obviously, as you can see now with both them looking to play D1 in the future for football, hopefully going to go on to some great things, maybe even professionally at one point. But I want to ask you guys, of course, that question of how it felt growing up around sports, how it was with that environment and that mindset around you. Um, it's definitely uh... – Something every kid should do because it'll make you more athletic and definitely I don't I don't see it now but definitely in the future I'll see like the work ethic it put in me whether I continue to play or do whatever come count or whatever you know <laughs> <laughs> but uh it's definitely a fun thing to do and football is a great sport and greatest sport in the world might be a little biased but <laughs> I think a lot of people can uh, agree with that. 100% brings everyone around the nation around one TV every Sunday for every single game. It's yeah. one of the greatest sports in the world. Sure is. What about you, Dante? Uh, I can agree with Case. I'm a little biased. We're both a little biased. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I didn't play football until I was a freshman in high school. But before that, I grew up with it. Obviously, I was watching my dad. I was growing up, all that. I played flag football. I wasn't allowed to play until freshman year. Always begging my parents, but... Yeah, growing up around football, like football has really shaped my life. So <laughs> I don't know. I love the game. It's obviously my favorite sport. It's my only sport, and I don't know. Football is a big part of my life, and always will be. Yeah, you mentioned it's your only sport, Dante. But when you're so good at something, 107 tackles this year, I believe, is what it was. Is that, yeah. that correct? Yeah. So 107 tackles leading the team. You don't need another sport. You don't need to run track in the winter at that point. You're not going to get 107 tackles in track, basically. That's not how it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Case, you obviously only play football, too. Oh, no, you play basketball, too, right? Basketball yeah, in the winter? I played last season. I don't know if I'm going to play next year, though. Yeah. Just like you know, basketball's whatever, you know. No. I lost <laughs> too much weight. I lost too much <laughs> I lost too much weight during it. Just don't really like playing more, you know. Yeah, so did I, the running throughout basketball and all that, you mentioned losing weight, did it kind of just mess up your bulk for oh, playing D-line? Is that it's, uh, uh Before the football season, I was 240. And I would say, like, after football, I was, like, 235, so I lost a little bit, but, like, that's whatever. Yeah. And after basketball, I was down to 220, and it was it sucked. Dang, like, especially yeah. when I had Coach Curran, after, like, a couple weeks of basketball, he's like, man, you look like you're in shape. And, like, <laughs> that was not a compliment. <laughs> that, just, that, one, that one hit me. I was like, damn, man. And you're, your own D line coach is telling you you're too skinny. I was like, yeah, that sucked. Yeah, but no, now, it's just a long look in the mirror after that one case. A couple sure. of weeks after basketball, back up to 240, so I mean, it's fine. But, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Literally. Like, <laughs> well, only what? Three or four weeks out, I'm only 20 pounds up, so. It's just just work right there. Then, case you mentioned yeah. the work ethic earlier coming in handy right there you just be able to fluctuate weight that easily that's just great yeah okay so you made me laugh earlier i meant to mention this before we go past this point you mentioned that the work ethic might help you with a little bit of accounting in the future like that i had a picture of my mind you ever see the incredibles dante you know when he's just oh, sitting inside that that yeah. office building he's just way too big there i kept imagining case in that setting one day yeah. <laughs> yeah. okay but now nah, we started talking about a little bit of bulk a second ago obviously case 20 pounds in one week is pretty insane to see dante though Throughout COVID, obviously, we're repeating a little bit of points right now, obviously, for both of you. This was all mentioned in the uh, in the cut episode where we got the video corrupted. We're going to be recalling that right now, though. Dante, your bulk, I saw you before quarantine. Obviously a big kid, and obviously you played quarterback at that point. Made sense you played quarterback for that size. You came back as a full linebacker. You came back just massive at that point. I remember you coming out of the bathroom cell, me not even recognizing you for a second because it was just that insane. How was it going through that bulk, and what would you say you really learned throughout that? Well, yeah, freshman year I played quarterback, as you just mentioned. I was a really skinny kid. I mean, we were all skinny freshman year. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> even Case was skinny. <laughs> but, yeah, I was a skinny quarterback freshman year. Played a little linebacker. I was better at quarterback freshman year, though. But uh, after freshman year, I was working on uh, 
quarterback in quarantine. I was getting like big as I was like working on quarterback, but I realized I was getting too big to like play quarterback anymore. So I dropped that. Completely changed everything. Uh, worked out in quarantine with Case and put on like like 50 pounds over like the course of like six months. <laughs> and I remember with the hybrid days, you were in my group cohort. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I didn't see you in a while actually. And I saw you like coming out of the bathroom and you're just like, is that Dante? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> so yeah, that was, that was a huge bulk and different time for me. Cause I, I knew I couldn't play quarterback anymore. So yeah, I imagine it's a lot more fun doing the hitting than getting hit as well. I yeah. can't imagine that. That yeah. side of the coin is a little bit different for sure. It's better too. Yeah. No, you obviously fit there. 107 tackles. I keep just repeating, obviously, because it's just such a mind blowing stat. Can I give Case a little bit of credit here too? 7.5 sacks this season, led the team as well. Two leaders of the teams on defense as juniors right now. You guys are going to be going into your senior season next year. How is it looking right now for the outlook, and what are you guys looking forward to for that final season? Uh, first of all, I can't believe it's already here. Yeah. I mean, like Dante said, we're just little skinny guys again. Freshman, <laughs> freshman year, like. Yeah, freshman year feels like yesterday. But a goal, definitely North Iowa Week One. That's a W. Uh, hopefully, don't want to jinx it. <laughs> most likely. Yeah. And then definitely in St. Mary's, we got to beat like me and Dante. Since we're a sophomore in varsity, just couldn't beat him that year and last year. So like, it's like they're number one, kind of, mm-hmm. even above North. Yeah. <clears throat> so. Definitely like undefeated, St. Mary's. And then let's get another home playoff game and get a play a W playoff. Playoff W. Yeah. Oh, for <laughs> sure. That yeah. sounds like great aspirations. I'm gonna ask you, of course, Dante, what yours are in one second. But you guys obviously mentioned the St. Mary's play. That St. Mary's game. When I saw you boys after that, I could see just a fire light inside all of you. You guys went undefeated after that stretch. First home playoff game at Fien in twelve years. You boys should be proud of yourselves after that. In fact, you can take that type of rejection basically from a team end up beating you at that point. It was still early in the season, very easy to flip on your back, very easy to just give up and say maybe next year. You boys didn't do that. You burrowed your heads down, won out the entire season, and you guys can stand tall now saying, I had the first home playoff game at my high school in 12 years because of what I did this season. You guys should be proud of that. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, St. Mary's obviously a rough game, but I feel like last year we needed that. I mean, Fiend hadn't had, like, Bishop Fiend football. I hadn't had like a winning season like that in like I don't know 12 years yeah <laughs> 12 years so but yeah winning losing that game was like that we needed that even though like we all wanted to go undefeated losing that game definitely like got all of us mad and wanted to win the rest of our games so I mean if we won that game three games in a row I don't know how we would have felt but we're gonna get them next year but like when we lost that game we all wanted to win the rest of the season no matter what and now we have a fire lit under us for St. Mary's next year. So, yeah, it's yeah. going to be like a playoff game next year. I'm going to be yeah. trying my hardest to get back and oh, watch that St. Mary's game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> can imagine that one's going to be like the North game this year where just everyone just has a full culture change, basically, from how hard everyone's going. Mm-hmm. I meant to mention that to you boys, too, actually. We're going to talk about this a little bit. You boys playing so good this year, obviously brought together different aspects of the community. So many people in the crowd watching you guys. Obviously, the fan section is just freaking out. Even parents showed up more. How did it feel being able to recognize I've brought my school closer together this year with what I've done on the on the field? Yeah, that's a shout out to you, by the way, <laughs> getting everyone to go to the games. That's mostly you more than us. But <laughs> yeah, shout out to Fiend Fanatics, too. That's everyone getting there to the games. I mean, it was crazy. I didn't, some games like Reading game, uh, North game, Attleboro game. I didn't even think there were going to be that many people there. Yeah, like it was crazy to see everyone there. And obviously, guys like you hyping it up in school and like Billy Roach. <laughs> yeah, Billy yeah. obviously deserves a little bit of credit there, too. Getting for sure. people to go to games. Shout out to all of them. But yeah, us winning also had something to do with it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. No one's really going to want to watch a losing team. The fact that you guys had a show that you could basically sell as, with your game, that really just upped the ante to a whole new level. Uh, having a crowd, oh man, especially at, at that COVID season with no fans and stuff, that like. We had nobody at our games. Yeah, exactly. You went from nobody to just everyone. To everyone, like, the energy was insane. Like, having, like, the chants going and everyone cheering, that was was crazy. Yeah. And then also, like, after, like, a big W, just, like, in school the next day. Well, actually, no. Well, the next week, really, because it was on Friday night. But having, like, your (laughs) teachers and, like, other kids, like, nice game and stuff, like, that's cool, you know. 
Oh yeah, no, it probably just feels great being able to actually get that recognition. But both you boys, I actually meant to mention this too because it actually is pretty funny. I had an end goal throughout the entire season. Dante, of course, will know this especially. I had a goal throughout the season. It took me till one of the last games to get this. The Dante Bruschi chant took a little bit to get going. Walked around the entire crowd and said, we're yelling Dante's name right now. Got everyone up out of their seats, and we got the Dante Bruschi chant going. Ended up being able to focus on it. Heard a little bit of Case Mekin's chance throughout the year. Didn't have to step in and make one of those. We got the Dante Bruschi chant going. That can let me hold my head high. Felt like my first playoff game in 12 years, Alan. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that chant, dude. Uh, I never thought it'd come, but obviously you got everyone going around to say it. That was awesome. Yeah, but we lost that game. <laughs> it, it's okay. We got yeah. the chant going. So we, we got the you, chant you win going. some, you lose some, but it's okay. Yeah, but yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem, Dante. But we mentioned during the last episode, maybe the Mayans or someone, whoever, whichever civilization takes over us in the next thousand <laughs> years, are going to be able to find that audio and release it. Obviously, it's not coming out of light right now as we have no video to support it. But during that interview, I talked to you guys about that little gym that you guys had where you worked out during quarantine. You guys have step, kept steady with that throughout the last couple of years. Would you guys want to go in a little bit more detail for the audience about what that was and what that experience was like for you guys? Yeah, I'll start. But uh, quarantine hit. Uh, everyone, like, took it slow. But we definitely, like, for the first three months, we weren't doing anything. I'll, I'll admit that. <laughs> when quarantine hit, when it was, like, real and everyone was wearing a mask, paranoid everywhere, nobody was doing anything but – Three months went by, we were doing the virtual stuff and all that in sophomore year. Then me and Case were like, nobody else is doing anything, so let's hit the gym. <laughs> and me and Case started to go down to a Poito. He's, he's our trainer. So, yeah, we hit him up during quarantine. Like, we'd go, like, right after our virtual days, and we'd go right after school days. It all depended on the schedule. But we, we hit up that gym during quarantine when, like, nobody else wasn't. So yeah, that's what got us God, it's pretty strong. Dante, you want to show the crowd real quick the little reward that you got from working out so hard in that gym? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I got a – I was climbing a rope in the gym, and then I <laughs> fell down it, and it just rope ripped my hand. Yeah, yeah that was yesterday. Of, <laughs> price of being an athlete, though. You're actually yeah. sticking to it. Just keep working through it. The fact that you can actually show physical marks on your body from how hard you're working, not many people can do that. What about you, Case? What was your experience like with that gym? Um, it was grind. Yeah. You know. Hot ass day, I mean hot days, uh, freezing days especially, that sucked. And now I look back on it, uh, it went by pretty quick. But I feel like when it was happening, it was slower than ever, and definitely made me. I feel like I got bigger. Like look back on it, I think I put on like twenty pounds of muscle during that time. <laughs> like when no one else was really doing anything and. It was a big advantage going into that it season. It wasn't a gym either. It was just his garage. Yeah, it was a garage. So, so nobody right. was doing that. Yeah, no one else was working out in a garage during quarantine. They were just wishing. I know personally I was wishing I had a bench press in my basement the entire time. You guys were able to find a garage to work out, and you guys obviously looked a lot harder than I did there on that. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, no. We've obviously talked a little bit about football and stuff like that. In your guys' personal lives, what would you say the future outlook is right now Guys obviously have the recruiting coming up. Case just came back from UMass Amherst. Me and Dante were talking about that before that. You're obviously visiting UMass Amherst. I believe you said tomorrow, right, Dante? Saturday. Saturday, okay. So one day off, but it's okay. But yeah, you guys both in the same week are getting basically interviewed by like a D1 college for that. How has that process been for you guys so far, and what is the future outlook looking like for your college decision stuff right now? Uh, recruiting, I mean, it's fun to like go places and visit. It, recruiting is definitely stressful though like I mean I'm sure both of our Twitter DMs are like uploaded like just loaded with coaches and it's kind of like which one do I respond to and stuff and like I mean you have such little information on a college it's just hard to pick one like oh I'm gonna go visit this place just by like oh I don't know that guy went there I saw him visit there so but yeah uh, I've been visiting a couple of colleges for football and I'm going to UMass on Saturday but yeah hopefully I'll visit around like 10 schools and maybe by next season I'll narrow it down to five and hopefully end up getting offers from those five schools. Yeah, oh, that's smart for sure. Find 10 that you actually enjoy, and then five that you really, really like. Yeah. That's the best way to do it's it. It's probably sure. num around the number, yeah. Yeah, no, because a lot easier just to narrow it down gradually than just saying, like, I want these three schools and no other schools right away. Like, you guys obviously want to have an open mind with this type of thing. Uh, I'd say pretty similar, pretty similar to Dante. I just go into as many schools as I can to get on campus and stuff, and – 
check out the team. But I'd say the hardest part wouldn't even have to do with football. It's when a coach says, what do you want to do? It's like, dude, how? Like, That's I am true. 16 years old. How do I know what I want to do the rest <laughs> of my life? Like, yeah. yeah. I have, like, it's just like, dude, I don't know. Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. The coach, okay, yeah. Obviously, the coach, like, me and Kay spent a lot of visits already. But the coach will randomly ask you, like, during the visit, what do you want to do, like, academically or something? Yeah. And I just say, like, I mean, I honestly, I don't even know if I want to do this. But I just be like, yeah, business. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I don't know, man. Like, I don't know what I want to do. I mean, I want to play football. But I don't, other than that, I don't know what I would do. No. So, yeah, yeah, asking a high school kid before like everything is fully done, you're not really going to get a solid answer because even people who get into college, at, most of the time it takes a year or two to find out what they actually want to do. It's very select that they know yeah. what they want to do right away. Business is probably the smartest way to do that, honestly, though, because yeah. that can fall into so many different things like economics. So many different things. Yeah. yeah. I say business to one of the coaches. They're like, oh, business. I'm like, okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, the funny thing is is a couple majors, if you said to them, I imagine they look at you and you really want to do that you're coming here for football and that's what you want to do with yeah. it mm-hmm. like business kind of just covers everything so that's kind of the perfect one is that same strategy that you do in cases you just say business to yeah i mean yeah just generic like, <laughs> you could always, like, it's really generic yeah. Yeah. yeah the trick is you gotta look at them and say i want to do marketing but economic marketing just add a bunch of fancy words into it so yeah uh-huh. that's not really a major we have here no 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 i want to do economic marketing i yeah. swear i swear I mean, at the end of the day, unless it's like Ivy League, all they care about is how you play on the football field. No, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine they're really talking to either of you two because I think you're going to be just great at numbers in the future or anything like that. Yeah, we want this kid doing our books at this school in a couple of years. That is the end goal here. It's because you're going to be bringing championships to their school. Like They know exactly what they're here for. Mm-hmm. True. <laughs> so, okay. Both you boys, we've obviously covered a little bit, but I think we need to liven up the mood a little bit in here. I'd I've given you a little bit of regular questions right now, but we're going to maybe up the ante a little bit right now. I want to ask both you boys, I've asked this to a couple teams already, throughout the last couple football seasons, can you look back at a certain moment, a certain story at all, that is really unique or a little bit funny, basically, that you can point to, that you'll always have stand out in your mind when you think of high school football? Yeah, you got that grin. You go first. All right. This honestly has nothing to do with football, but it is the football team. And it's uh, actually our boy, Matt Saunders. So, were we freshmen? I think we were. So We were freshmen. We were incoming oh, freshmen, sorry, so we weren't even at school yet. We've never even been to a single class yet. Yeah. And this is summer workouts, and we're up in the rock, and we're all huddled around Coach. Coach P's talking. And Saunders was actually standing in front of me at the time. And I, did, <laughs> man, I didn't even know, like, who anybody is, really. Like, I don't, I don't know who anyone is. I'm just yeah. a stupid freshman. <laughs> And Saunders lifts up his leg and lets one rip. As Coach P is talking, Coach P is like saying something, and he lets one rip. It was bad too. Yeah. It, it wasn't was, it, like a sneak. It was oh, like, it was a nice, oh. it was a nice one. Yeah. And then Coach P, man, he just everyone's dying laughing, and he's just like, "Yeah, I'm not laughing." And then we did 20 push-ups. Like, I'll, def- I'll remember that one for a long time. That was a good one. But. Yeah. Just immediately gave you the repercussions from that. The funniest thing, that was your guys' freshman year. That was Coach P's first year, too. What do you yeah. think he was thinking when he got in the classroom and a sophomore just did that right in front of him? Yeah. Just, wow, welcome to the team for me, I guess. It's, it's a lot better than a welcome basket. Yeah. What about you, Dante? What's your favorite story you can point to? My story is actually in a football practice. Yeah. A little different than cases, but uh, <laughs> it wasn't so funny at the time, but it's funny now. So I'm sure you're gonna. I thought you think you're gonna ask this question later, but Crump, somebody I looked up to as a captain. Yeah. Uh, we get into it every practice. It's a love hate relationship, and we trash talk. I'm I'm the Mike linebacker. He's the quarterback. So he's scout team O. I'm defense. So we're always going at it. Yeah. Then one time he's just going crazy and like he like throws some deep pass on me. He was always dotting us up. Great quarterback. Shout out to Crump. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he was dotting us up, and I was just getting angry. So he runs like an outside sweep, like right to the outside, outside the tackle. And I just go right behind him and throw my elbow and shoulder right into his back. <laughs> just lay him straight to the ground and lay him out. And he gets up and starts like fighting me. And like everyone, <laughs> it starts a whole fight. Yeah. I laid him out. Billy Roach was fighting people. But it was like a big fight. And like it was just funny though, because after in the locker room, we were like, I was like, you like that hit? And he's like, yeah. And we laughed about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. moments like that bring the team together throughout yeah. the season because that actually shows you guys are competitive and stuff like that. I feel like whenever there's a fight on a football field, though, you can find Billy Roach somewhere in there. It's out of nowhere. He'll just sneak over and be like, oh, they wanted to start this with me? 
Yo, uh, Billy Roach and Kinahan. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah. It was like at least once a week they were going at it about something like yeah, not even something like it was just like the dumbest thing. Like it's good fights though. It's not like stupid personal fights. No, nah, exactly. It's not like they're pulling up on. Like, I always fight Crump in practice, and then after I'm just like, yeah, what's up, bro? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, the thing is, football fights where it's just a competitive edge against each other, those are good for the team. Personal fights, like you mentioned, obviously aren't where they're bringing in like family members or something like that. Like, not not really a place on the football field for that type of stuff. You kind of have to just close your eyes and you put that helmet on and realize you're in a new world. But nah, both those stories are just pretty great examples of the team. Saunders, obviously, we had on here in episode Crump we had on as well. You can check those out. They signed the board. Mm-hmm. But you obviously gave a little bit of a preview of this, Dante. So I'll just ask you boys in now. Throughout the last couple of years, you guys have obviously learned from a lot of different figures. Who would you say has mentored you the most and helped you the most in shaping your game? All right. I got two of them, uh, Matt Saunders and Aiden Crump. First of all, Matt Saunders, I mean, we had a great relationship. He was a guy above me as linebacker, and I, I thought I was going to be, like, under him. Like, I didn't think I was going to be playing right next to him. I thought maybe he might be taking my spot, but ended up we just ended up playing side by side. But he kind of, like, took me under his wing and mentored me because I was a linebacker, same position as he. We, like, making tackles together. But, yeah, Saunders was a guy, like, I went out and ate with him, just me and him a lot. But, yeah, he kind of took me under his wing and showed me what Fiend football is all about. And he's a great player, obviously. Saved the Fenwick game for us. Dear God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that play was insane. That was, that was on, like, a 98-yard return or sign, right, for the mm-hmm. touchdown? Yeah. Yeah, and that was an interception, 99. too. Yeah, 99. Okay, yeah, 99. I thought he maxed it out. Yeah, 99 interception return for the touchdown. Just changed the whole ties of that game. But, yeah, Saunders is my guy. And the second one is Crump. Yeah. I mean, that's a whole different relationship because we have a – a strong love-hate relationship during the season because, as I just said, we trash talk a lot. Got personal, too. Sometimes bring in a little little X's in there. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it gets personal out there. But, yeah, we trash. I trash talk Crump all the time in practice. I'm going to miss that next year. Damn, bro. Yeah, no Crump or Saunders <laughs> next year. But, yeah, I trash talk him all the time. But then in school, it's like we're boys and all. But, yeah, I love trash talking him. It made me a way better competitor. So shout out to Aiden Crump and Matt Saunders. <laughs> yeah, I really love that you mentioned the trash talk aspect, Dante. Trash talking is really what sets up a competition. You can't go into a competition like, oh, okay, we're all friends in this. When you're on that field, you forget who the other person is, basically. You don't have any relationship with them. You go one-on-one against them. Crump is one of the biggest trash talkers I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know from first-hand experience that Crump just likes to dig on her peel's skin because he knows it's going to open that little element that they didn't realize they had in themselves. Maybe they're going to go a little harder on the next exactly. day. Maybe they fully wrap game. up. Yeah. That's what we did for the game. Exactly. And it's obviously helped your game. You're going into the senior year, you're both going to be captains now. Obviously, I've learned a lot over the last four years. All right, Case, what about you? Uh, number one, I would have to say, like, last year's captains. They were great leaders and just great guys off the field, like hanging out with them out of school, you know. Just yeah. Had a lot of fun with them. But my, like, my number one would be Carter. Definitely my sophomore year, he was a captain. And he definitely made me like the lineman that I am now, and he had a little chip on his shoulder and liked to fight, and I'd say I'd follow that too. Get a little <laughs> fifteen-yard penalties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, coach doesn't like that one, but yeah, forget. Carter would appreciate that for sure. That Carter is true. Campbell that is true. <laughs> was a great player last year. I do remember watching his plays. He was just a shining spot on that team. Yeah. I would you say you replicate a little bit of his game sometimes when you look at because he obviously used a lot of strength in his game. I imagine you do the exact same case. Yeah, a lot. I'm definitely a little chippy out there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we are going to go into a break real quick. We'll be right back. We are just making sure this video does not get corrupted. Okay, now we are finally back for the final section of the Jota's Hour, episode 11 with Dante Bruschi and Case Mankins. Finally got over those problems, kept pausing the video, kept getting, obviously got the first entire version corrupted, but now we are here. And we are here to talk about a little bit of football with Dante and Case. Wanted to ask you boys, this is about my third time asking you boys this question now because of the video mistakes. What was it like during the atmosphere at the North Atterborough game? Everyone could feel it there. Crowds were packed. Baby power flying around the air almost to the point it was suffocating. Everyone knew that this game was going to define the season. After you won that game, everyone rushed the field and just hyped you up. What did that set your expectations for the rest of the season, and what did you start thinking about? Uh, it was definitely insane because – that the atmosphere was insane, and everyone rushing the field after and just running around on community field, which was where I played during my middle school years. And 
being able to come back and win on that field and being all the guys I grew up with and played with before then. And being from me and Dante being from North Adderborough, that was a big game because we all knew we all knew everybody who we were playing and tackling and trash talking on the field and it was a big what was it, five, six months when we found out we were gonna play him. Mm-hmm. It was like stressful times, not even be able to sleep sometimes and being in school just all I could think about and then we beat him and that's when I really knew that like we had a squad and yeah. we could we could beat a lot of teams. Yeah. Yeah, S- same thing for me as Case. I mean, after that game, we definitely knew that we had a team and we could go far. After that game, we definitely knew that. But that game was uh, probably my favorite game of the season. I mean, by far. I, that's. I mean, arguably, we had the most fans at that game probably. Yeah. In our student section, maybe the Reading game, but you could say either way. But yeah, the baby powder was flying after the game. That was crazy. Um, I mean, we were getting booed as we were going on the field yeah. by, like, little, like, 10-year-olds. Like, <laughs> people would take that, like, to offense. I was just like, this is funny, bro. Like, random 10-year-olds with North jerseys walking around booing us. Like, okay, dude. <laughs> See the scoreboard at the end of the game. And then, like, they thought they were going to kick our asses, though. They said it was going to be our funeral. They wore, like, funeral clothes there. I mean, I don't know why they thought they were going to kick our asses. We beat them by two touchdowns, so yeah. it wasn't even close. But, <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Yeah, no, they're a good team, though. They obviously went to the Super Bowl, but that, that was a good win for us. And we'll get them again next year. Yeah, Yeah, I feel you can't trash talk that much and then lose the game, though, is the yeah. thing. When you do uh-huh. that, it kind of loses credibility on that. You guys obviously yeah. had every member of that community trash talking you as you tried to just enter in the field. You so, guys showed yeah. up. Sometimes I feel like after we beat a team, like you beat them, so you got nothing else to say. But, I mean, they thought they are going to kick our asses, so I don't feel bad talking about how trash they were. And, <laughs> yeah. I mean, they thought they were going to really destroy us. What are they talking about? It's our funeral. Are you going to dress like it's our funeral? It just gets me mad. But nah. I don't have to talk about it anymore. We beat them. We'll do it, we'll do it next year, too. No, exactly. Maybe we dress for the funeral next year. So we'll, we'll figure yeah. it out. But it's still, every single time I hear something like that about the dressing for the funeral thing, they're, they're just dressing preppy as a funny thing. They're I just know, wearing a button down dress. shirt. Yeah. Why it, weren't they wearing black like dresses and. It was not funeral dress. Well, the thing that that would be funny if they did that. If they yeah. showed up in full black dresses, yeah. all the guys are wearing tuxedos. Uh-huh. Like one guy's holding a black umbrella for no yeah. reason. That'd be hilarious. They're showing up with, oh, I'm wearing a button-down shirt and khaki pants. I'm like a funeral right now. That's awesome. That's not how it works. Yeah, at least put effort into it. Might as well just do Jersey Day at that point for the crowd. So, we obviously have talked about a couple games so far. Obviously, talked about the playoff game. Talked about North Adboro. Wanted to ask you boys, obviously talk about St. Mary's as well. Ignoring those three teams, going in next year, are there any teams that you guys just already have marked down as this game is going to need to be a big game and we're going to win this one? I have one. I think Dante would agree with Fenwick because uh, we lost to him our sophomore year and then we beat him last year and it was a great game. So I feel like... It's one and one, so there's there's only one more yeah. left. So yeah. I feel like it's like the final one for us. And they're definitely a good team, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're overall a great team. Yeah, you guys got that tiebreaker this year, though, which would be good. Yeah, we compete with them pretty good, and it was fourteen zero, three thirteen zero at halftime, something like that. But we didn't score until the second half. So, I mean, they had us like, <laughs> but in the second half we came out rolling. But yeah, it's definitely going to be a good game next year. But I mean. Obviously, another game I got in my map is the Super Bowl. Hopefully, we get there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, D2, it's really competitive. There's so many good teams. But, yeah, I got that game on my map. Yeah, I believe in you boys for the Super Bowl next year. I'm going to be watching your progress the entire season because I want to see you boys playing at Gillette next year. I, w- I want that for you guys. You guys have deserved it after everything you've gone through so far. The fact you guys made it through that COVID season and all you continued playing football, a lot of kids would just quit at that point because they think – Kind of like COVID, they would just kind of just think in the short term. They wouldn't be thinking after thoughts like that. Like after COVID's done, we're going to be a great team. You're going to be thinking like, wow, it kind of sucks wearing a mask on the field right now. Try wearing a mask under a football helmet. Exactly. It's that's what I'm saying. Not, why? Yeah, it like seems terrible. I'm spitting on you and tackling you. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the point of wearing it? It's just, I don't know. The, I, I have a lot of thoughts on the masks and stuff. but <laughs> Yeah. No, I'm happy we're out of that time now. It's a lot yeah. better now. Uh-huh. Yeah. So to find, or case okay, so you know, yeah. Before we move on, I have a question for you, Jordas. Yeah, okay. Um, what is, what is like your inspiration, or why did you get into like broadcasting slash, interviewing and whatever? Like, I agree with the who? 
What yeah. is Joe Dez? We're flipping the interview. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> Did not expect this to be what happened today, boys, but okay. So, used to uh, – I might as well tell the full story right now, really. I used to not really be, like – Obviously, we go to Fian now, so I'm going to sound hypocritical saying this. Not, not like, did not have a lot of money, kind of lived in an apartment in Atterbury at one point. And what we'd do after school was I'd get dropped off at this program, basically, so my parents wouldn't have to, like, say, oh, make you go to work and stuff. And I found out later this program I should not have been in. My mom did not read the description. It was for Hispanic kids to get integrated into American life. And <laughs> I'm obviously not Hispanic, and I am already integrated into American life. But one of the field trips they took us on throughout this was they took us to a place called WARA, which is a radio broadcast station in Atterbury. And they were going throughout all of there. And that it was just so cool to see all the mics and everyone actually talking. And realizing like, talking can be your job. It just sounds so cool to me. And all my life, I've kind of listened to podcasts. I've listened to just people on the air now a lot of the time. Like, that was a big part of my childhood, just looking up to those type of people. And one big thing was I, I used to want to do economics and business because I didn't really have a defined path for what I wanted to follow. And I was just sitting in the car with my friend Will Slavin. You guys obviously know Slavin. And he was talking to me and saying, like, yeah, every kid wants to do business, but what do you want, like, actually want to do? Now what are you going to do? Because like, I thought I was just going to do the boring regular route at that point. And I started thinking for like a day or two. And I realized like, I've always been pretty good at talking to people. I like learning about people's lives. And I've had a pretty good memory for a while. And I, I started just remembering, I used to really think that place is awesome when I went on that trip to WARA when I was like eight years old. And it kind of just flashed back. And I started emailing every radio station around the, like around the area. I emailed Providence, emailed in Boston, WEI. And I got one response out of 20 of them. And it was WARA in Atterbury, the same exact place I had gone to as a kid. So it just kind of came full circle. It was pretty crazy stuff. That's pretty cool because, I mean, talking to people is definitely like, I think that's a good, like a good if gift you to have. Like, talk to people, you live in a good life. Exactly. Yeah. Like people might make jokes about people being in the press box, like, "Oh, they're the nerds of football." Like, we're we're having fun. We're watching you guys. Like you guys obviously work throughout the season and stuff. We kind of just get to sit back and relax a little bit. One more question, then we'll flip the questions back to you. Yeah. So, what singular broadcaster like do you look up to the most? Like, be famous dude or anybody? Just pick one guy. Just one guy. That's all I want to know. You ever hear Brockmire? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no Brockmire? Uh, I think so, yeah. Wait, um, what does he do? He's not a real person. He's a TV show guy. But I, I, so being realistic, I'll, I'll explain what Brockmire is. Yeah. He has real quick. Brockmire is this announcer. He has a TV show. Not a real guy. He's basically a minor league baseball announcer. But he told he, me about this last night. Yeah, he just yeah. parties a ton. He's a really cool guy. <laughs> and uh, the first episode starts off with him just getting really messed up on the mic and just talking about why his ex-wife cheated on him and stuff like that to a public crowd, just kids and stuff. Really funny show. If anyone's watching, you should check out Brock Meyer, one of the greatest sports shows out there. But in all reality, Kevin. First and goal. 29 seconds left. Here, Butker kicks the extra point. And Fitzpatrick throws in the end zone. Touchdown, Miami. The Dolphins have just scored. Gasicki, the tight end, got a laser in the back of the end zone on a goal to go touchdown pass by Miami quarterback Ryan Fitzpatrick to take a lead with 24 seconds to go. The extra point coming up for Miami, leading New England 26 to 24. I'm getting confused. What game are you calling? I'm calling both games. <laughs> Here is the Harlan is a, just a, such a great announcer. He is, there's one game that you can find the clip of. I'll probably include it right here or something. But there's a point where he was calling two games at once in the NFL, and he actually managed to call both of them. And the guy was talking, like, what game are you talking about right now? He said, I'm doing both games at once. And it was one of the coolest calls. Mm -hmm. And then what he does, which I kind of started picking up last, last season when I announced, is he, he'd pick, like, random stuff throughout the game or throughout the crowd just to basically announce like it was a sporting event. Like, there was a cat running across the field, and he'd go, like, the cat's at the 50, at the 40, it's closing at the 30, and then just keep going like that. And – there was one time when the girls' soccer coach at Fian had a, there was a ball kicked really high in the air, and he basically kick returned, like caught it. So I started commenting on him like he was an actual player. I was like, and the coach lines up under the ball, and he catches it for the kick return, like messing with him like that. And I ended up actually doing it. It was one of my favorite calls I've made. But I'd say Kevin Harlan's probably the one I look up to the most. You told me about that Brockmire guy, and I looked him up, and I found, I swear to God, I found nothing. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really hope I got the right name one second. <laughs> Yeah, no, he is uh, – so basically he is what is supposed to be the epitome 
Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, I did get the name right. I was really worried I misdirected you. I'll show you that after, though, Dante, for sure. But nah, really funny guy. Wears a sports coat all the time. It's kind of like the stereotypical broadcaster where he has the radio voice, but then he just does everything that broadcaster shouldn't do, basically. It's pretty funny to see. It seems funny. Yeah. <laughs> so to end off this, I'm going to take back the mic and ask one final question to you boys. As you gaze off into the future and into the past, obviously, would you guys like to give any shout outs to anyone throughout your life that has helped you get to this point, get to the point where you're looking possibly at D1 future and, and possibly even playing professional at one point? Uh, I'd say number one, hmm, actually, I'm not going to put a number on it because I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd say my family and my parents and uh, Coach Portamani for training us. And mm -hmm. I'd say definitely without him, I wouldn't be nearly as strong or a player as I am. And I'd say Bishop Fian. That's a great community, and not even just football. I'm talking about like the school and football, really. Just a great community where everyone comes together and feels like home. Nah, for sure. It's just great the family feeling basically around all of Fian. I could shout out people that have helped me get to where I was like for hours, and like I, that's a that's a long list of people. Yeah, I could do that forever. But like, yeah, my family, they, and my, of course my dad. He's coached me. He disciplined me ever since I was born. And, like, all my friends, just guys like Case, like, like my teammates, like, I grew up with, like, they pushed me, they competed with me, and obviously my trainer, Portamani. But, yeah, mainly my friends and, like, my mostly my teammates. Because, like, I mean, those are the guys I grew up with, and those are the guys you're with the most, even more than, like, when you're at your house. I mean, if you're at school six hours, you go home for, like, four hours, go to bed, you go back to school, especially during football season. I mean, you're around your teammates for, like, 11 hours a day. Yeah. I mean, just guys like Case and my teammates, yeah. <laughs> I never really yeah. thought about that, Dante. Yeah. You're fully right, though. You do spend more time with them. That's why they are starting Nobody to play Nobody like thinks about yeah, that. I, like, people wow. shout out their family and stuff. When you go home, like, it's like you're five hours to do homework and you go to bed the next day. But if you play a sport, you wake up and it's like you're with six hours a day for school and you got four hours of, like, practice. That's, like, yeah. 11 hours of, <laughs> of you at school. I mean, <laughs> yeah. That, not at, you're actually giving me a full new perspective. I used yeah. to wonder why teams would always feel like a brotherhood by the end of the season. You guys are just spending like countless hours with each other after all. And I didn't want to mention this during the regular interview. I'm going to mention it now. I'm going to retread some old territory. It was in the old interview we mentioned you both being able to go competitive against each other because you're around the same level, which helped you during quarantine, obviously. You, having that competition just directly across from you, that has to help just so much. <laughs> like you can really look at it and think, like, wow, he's – putting in more work than me right now. I need to up this up, or he's kind of being lazy. I need to get him to start chasing me a little bit. I can take this on first. I mean, so obviously on the football field, I mean, me and Case compete. We hit each other. He, he destroys me sometimes. I mean, I get him a couple times. It's just like that on the football field. Yeah. But, I mean, we grew up together. He lives, like, right down the street. So, I mean, uh, we used to play his tackle football league in my front yard <laughs> with the kids in the neighborhood. No pads on, just a little foam football and we used to just tackle each other. It would get heated. <laughs> you remember that? We were in elementary school. But, I mean, like, even little stuff like that, just growing up around that just helped me, like, be a competitor. But, yeah, no pads or anything. We are just throwing each other on concrete and grass. And <laughs> I have pictures from it. It's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. No, that's really cool that you guys have done that since even elementary school. It's just really sick. Like, it's pretty sick seeing that bond last that long. And we played basketball together for, like, five years. But, yeah, growing up, like, yeah. Makes you into a great competitor. Yeah, no, obviously both are now captains on a senior football team. That, that's just going to be so cool. I'd say definitely having Dante and other players that, you know, are, like, showing out at practice and yeah. doing good things makes me want to work harder and try and stop them from doing that, especially against me. Uh, Dante making tackles against the <laughs> offense and stuff, like, it's on me to make a block against him. So, you know, it definitely makes me so work, work right? harder. Sophomore year, I didn't play offense, so I was on the scout team defense. I was a problem for you guys. <laughs> yeah. 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 But yeah, competing against your friends is so fun. Yeah. I mean, you can fight them on the field and then see them in school and be like, hey, man, we're fine. Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. We'll go from one minute just cracking each other's yeah. skulls to five minutes later in a car eating burgers yeah, it's, together. Like, it's, it's, it's just the best. normal. Yeah, it's so cool. <laughs> okay. I've said final question about three times already. I have one final question I want to ask you guys before we wrap this up. Obviously, Coach P, probably a massive part of you guys' development lately. How would you say your guys' relationship with Coach P, Coach Pinbell, obviously, had him in for the Super Bowl special? 
how would you say that has shifted over the last couple of years and how has that has helped you basically? Because he was the coach right when you guys came to school. Yeah, coaching his, our freshman uh, class was his first year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I love the man and I'm sure he loves us and he's just a great, fun guy to be around. Even, even off the field, he's just, I mean, how can you not like the guy? Like, yeah. Yeah. He's got a lot of energy, a lot of energy, like <laughs> almost too much energy. He's, <laughs> He's always hyped up about something, and he's just a great guy. Yeah, I was great at like 7 a.m. when you're too tired in school. You see him just fully awake, just fully hyped up. You can't can't be tired after that. You have to get to match his energy. Yeah, five. You just brought up a good point. Yeah, Coach P does a lot for us. I mean, I I think I mean he obviously organizes our practice. He schedules all the games and all that stuff. I mean, he does all that stuff for us. But like. The biggest thing he does is bring the energy, and you don't see that from a head coach. <laughs> like, even all the colleges I visit, the head coach usually is off to the side, like, just watching. But Coach P's out there, like, he's like, welcome to the freak show. <laughs> <laughs> like, screaming at, like, 5 a.m. in the morning, and we're all like, okay, here we go. It's time to lift. <laughs> but, yeah, Coach P, I think my favorite part about him is the energy he brings. And, like, I, I love energy, so that, that's why he's – that's why I like him. Yeah, well, you sometimes see coaches do, like, five push-ups with their team when they're doing, like, 20. But Coach P gets down and dirty with that. He fully just goes fully mindset like he's on the team, like he's going to go crack someone's skull on the field. He's just fully hyped up 24-7. That's perfect for a coach, basically. Yeah. Okay, guys, I think this is about where we'll wrap this up. This has been a great interview so far. This has been Episode 11 of the Joe Hour with Dante Bruschi and Case Mankins. If you guys want to check out their futures, I'll try linking your guys' Twitters in the bottom or something so you can see where they end up committing in the future. i going to include some pictures throughout all of this of where they're basically playing football, basically where they're trying on some outfits from different colleges for D1. Pretty cool to see, obviously. going to hopefully try to find some pictures of you guys playing like first grade uh, football together, right? Oh, I got pictures. <laughs> yeah, we're going to find those pictures for sure. Yeah. Okay, well, this has been a great episode. Episode 11 is now in the books of the Jota's Hour. Tune in next time. <laughs>